Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, my guest today is back by popular demand. He was so popular last time we couldn't get to all your questions, so he saved some of them and prepared a presentation based on them. He is going to be talking about how you can strengthen your bones on a vegan diet and much more. His name is Maxime, and please welcome him back to the show. It's great to see you again. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Very excited to be back. Yeah, now in case someone didn't see the last episode, which I will link to right below in the show notes, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why you do it vegan. Yes, um, so I am the founder and CEO of Fit Vegan Coaching. Uh, we're a coaching practice that is international. We've helped over almost 500 vegans at this point from 20 different countries completely transform their health, their body, and their lifestyle. And so I'm on a big mission to help the world get lean, thrive, and disease-proof their body because I've personally lost a lot of family members, including an ex-partner, to breast cancer and to different chronic diseases. And I don't want anyone to have to go through that, which it can easily be preventable through an active lifestyle and a whole food plant-based way of eating. Amen to that. When did you first find out about it yourself? Uh, nine years ago, slightly over nine years ago. Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you for doing what you do, because I think there's such a belief in the fitness industry that got to have protein, the more, the better. And it's yeah. got to be from animals, right? Yeah, well, there's definitely uh, coming from the bodybuilding world way back in the days, a lot of chicken and, you know, steak. And I, I'm really happy that I found this way of doing things. And then so many people have been able to benefit from it. And I'm happy that it's gaining popularity over the past few years. That is fantastic. I love it. What's the most common question you get asked about fitness? Oh, when it comes to fitness, obviously, how much is how much protein do you actually need? Second would be, um, I can't lose weight as on a vegan diet because there's too much carbs. So it's impossible to do it. So that's another big one. And then um, third is, I don't have a lot of energy. When I'm trying to like lose weight on a vegan diet, people go too low in their calories. Again, there's a there's more education that needs to be put out in this space. But those tend to be the main the main three ones, definitely the protein and uh, the carb aspect. I, people still believe that that's all I eat is carbs. And that's how yeah. I got thin. I mean, I, I just don't get it. Why are they so afraid? Yeah, even well, a fruit, even a fruit, you know, people are afraid of fruit, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just saw someone post about like people uh, not wanting to eat fruit out of fear of having diabetes. How, how does that make to, to me, it doesn't make sense. Been in this space for a long time, done the research. But yeah, it's it's a belief that needs to go away. Oh boy. Well, thank you for doing your part in it. So you work with people nationally and internationally. Do, is it always virtually? Or I know with the pandemic, a lot of people had to switch to that. And a lot of people stayed doing that because they could reach so many more people. Yeah. So er everything is virtually because it just allowed me to reach more people and impact more people. I've done in-person coaching before, but I'm very limited to my community. And by going online, it allowed me to impact people in Switzerland and Greece and Australia, which I otherwise would never have the opportunity to meet. So Definitely love online because you can have a greater impact than you can if you're in person. But can you see like the nuances? Like, you know, sometimes like the trainer will come up to you and kind of like, you know, straighten you up a little bit, things like that. Yeah. So what we do for our members is we create their training plan. They also have videos that shows them exactly how to perform the exercise, but they also have the ability to fill themselves and send it to our coaches so that it can get feedback on their form. Um, so whenever there's a doubt, film a video, if there's someone is biking, like my hip is hurting when I'm biking, let's film a video of you biking from the side or for the back. And it will give you some tips as to how to adjust your seat or how to adjust the movement. Great. One of the live viewers is saying that she lost so much muscle mass with menopause and really needs to gain it back. And can that happen? Oh, absolutely. We had a ton of members um, going through menopause that were able to lose weight and able to pack on some muscle just comes down to making sure that you're using smart nutrition. Smart nutrition, utilizing strength training. Strength training can come in many, many different forms, but it's definitely possible because we've done it, I would say, over 60 times at that point. Probably shot over 60 members going through menopause. Wow, that's fantastic. Are most of your clients of, of a certain age group? Are they mostly male, female? Are you are kids even? Well, who do you work with mostly? Uh, I mo mostly work with adults ranging from 40 to 70 years old. That tends to be like our, um, our main demographic that is looking to improve themselves. And 
is more on the side of prioritizing their health. You know how it is when, when you're a little bit younger, you're like, I'm going to live forever. I don't need to do all of these things. And so as you get a little bit older, you're a bit more precautious um, and you want to have that action plan to put yourself in that place where your body won't be a limitation in the future, where you're disease proofing your body and where you actually place more value on health than on just aesthetics. When people come to you, Maxime, are they already vegan? And, and do they know that that's what you're going to recommend? Or is it both types of clients that they're, they're not vegan yet, but you help them transition? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say about 50% of our members go vegan to be in a program. Everyone knows that they have to go vegan to be in a program. I do not work with non-vegans. If there's an interest to be healthier and lose weight, we will educate you. We will help you through that transition of eating whole food plant-based but we don't include any animal products in our meal plan because it just goes against my, my value and belief system that if you actually want to thrive, you, you need to be eating whole food plant-based. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks for doing that's it. That's great that you can actually be selective like that. And, and cause a lot of people say, Oh, we got to meet people where they are, but I'm thinking you maybe think you can't get the results that you want if they don't follow your food plan. Yeah. Everyone, if they follow the meal plan hundred percent, they get hundred percent of the results, right? It's, We've, we've proven that over and over almost 500 times, and it, we have a, a clear process to get people to where they want to on a whole food plant-based diet. So it simply comes down to, to coming in, trusting the process, doing the work, and then getting the results. Nice, nice. So let me look in the chat and see if there's any questions. I know we had so many. Oh, here's one from Sarah. I want to lose weight, but I don't want to starve. Can you help me? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hello, Sarah. Um, so... Eating a whole food plant-based diet is very rich in fiber, high in volume. So when we create our nutrition plan for our members, we get, we're using whole food plant-based diet. And so when we create the initial meal plan or a normal reaction is I can't eat all this food. I can't believe that I'm, I'm going to lose weight. I think I'm going to gain weight if I eat all of this, but because we focus on high fiber and nutrient density, our members are always satiated right? The issue comes when you cut your calories too low, or when you use utilizing foods that are not whole food plant-based and are a bit more processed, they tend to be more calorie dense. So you feel less satiated on them. So just focusing on whole food plant-based and really high volume foods is going to make the world of a difference. As a quick example, eating a date versus four cups of strawberries, same amount of calories, but there's a very big difference in volume, just being more efficient with your choices. That's amazing that I, cause calorie density is my thing. And I mean, yeah. like, I love those comparisons that, you know, you can eat more and weigh less. Yeah, absolutely. And that is really, really cool. Where do you stand on the protein powders? Cause I know, I, you know, Robert Cheek, of course, cause by the yeah. way, you're going to be coming back next month for a very special week of elite athletes. It's going to be hosted by Robert week. It starts Labor Day. It's called Cheek Week. And actually you're giving away a Breville air fryer, the big one. Yes. Well, but, but, you know, Robert Cheek has an interesting story because he did use protein powders and then he took the T. Colin Campbell nutrition course. And then he yeah. started to not use them after that because he realized it's not really necessary. Yeah. Um, personally, I do use protein powder. I just like that it makes it simpler to add more calories at a lower, lower, add protein at a lower calorie cost. So what I mean by that is as you start off your, your cut, your fat loss phase, you have a lot more calories than you can eat. But as you progress along, eventually you're going to get to a place where calories might be a little bit lower and therefore your calorie cost per gram of protein becomes important only for a short period of time. And so in that case, protein powder becomes very useful. Um, and obviously the importance is finding one that is, you know, no heavy metals, no chemicals, that's extremely clean. I personally like to use, uh, use veg nutrition. They will provide all the lab results are extremely clean. Um, and they make my smoothie taste a little bit better too. throw a little bit of, of vanilla in there. Um, and yeah, so it's definitely a useful tool uh, in my book at the right time. You know, I, I, I don't use them because I'm allergic to most legumes and they're always, they've yeah. always got pea protein, but I don't understand why they have to put like stevia in them. It, I think it tastes terrible when they sweeten them with that. Yeah. Well, you know, a good source of protein powder is uh, hemp, just pure, pure hemp protein because they use the seeds and then they cold press them out, which you get the oil, which you get hemp oil, which is extremely anti-inflammatory, great balance of omega-3 and omega-6. And then you get the hemp meal that is left over. And that's basically what hemp protein is. It's hypoallergenic. Most people don't have an issue with yeah. hemp. It's very and, rare. And seeds that, that makes, uh, I like the idea of getting it from seeds that are very healthy like that. Yeah. Hemp is a great one and you can buy it just plain with no additional ingredients or sweeteners or things to change the color. There's just buy pure hemp. It's a great source of protein. 
Oh, I love that. Uh, Mona says, I started adding chia seeds to my morning oat roads. Should I worry that it may cause my weight loss to slow? How many are you adding? If it's a tablespoon, I sure wouldn't worry. Yeah. Well, I, I, the, the clear answer is if you're still in an energy deficit, meaning in a calorie deficit, you're okay with it, right? There's a lot of health benefits coming with chia seeds. And so when you're looking at to do a fat loss, you have to find a balance between both. You have a certain amount of energy that you need to take in in order to accomplish the goal of fat loss. But then how can you maximize the amount of nutrient density for the amount of calories that you're supposed to eat? And so if for you eating one, two or three tablespoons of chia seeds in your morning smoothie helps satiate you and helps you get those nutrients in that makes you feel good, then do it as long as the overall energy intake for the day is where it needs to be for you to accomplish your goal. Right. Makes sense. Let's see. Uh, Meredith says, are you concerned about the excess protein and taxing the kidneys, liver, and bones? Great question. So that is the reason why I only recommend people eating 1.2 gram to 2 gram per kg of body weight, right? Most people will go for a 1 gram per pound of body weight. There's a lot of factors that make, that make it not work because if you have, if you're overweight, it doesn't make sense to eat that much protein, right? Per pound of body weight. And so 1.2 gram to two gram per kg of body weight is on the low end and is actually also a recommendation from Robert's book, right? A plant-based athlete. And you'll sometimes find in a study 0.8 gram per kg of body weight, which is the recommendation if you're a non-active individual. If you're not strength training, you're not physically active, that's the that's all you need in terms of protein to retain your lean muscle mass. So it's actually not a really big number when you make the math. Have you ever done any acting? Cause I'm looking at you and you look like you could just be on a, a show. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, but I did do uh, international modeling for a long time. What is international modeling versus national? I mean, I'm guessing all over the world. It's yeah. Like I worked in, in, in Milan in Italy. I worked in New York, worked in LA, worked a little bit everywhere. That's pretty cool. That the sounds really interesting, actually. Um, is it different? I mean, I didn't mean to segue, but now that that we that you're mentioning this, because I know that a lot of times, uh, you know, my, my friend John Pierre has worked with a lot of female models, and a lot of times mm -hmm. there's eating disorders in that uh, absolutely. profession. Yeah. With male models, is it is it is it the same? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely I definitely fell in, into that world, which is the reason why I built my life the way that I have. I built the program the way that I have. When I was in the modeling industry, the whole point is to be skinny. Muscle mass doesn't really matter. You just need to be skinny to fit into clothes. And as much as I can look, you know, fairly athletic on camera, I'm six foot four, 187 pounds. So if I have a fairly lean frame and I was still too big for when I was modeling. And so I went on a diet of, you know, running three hours a day and just eating rice to lose as much muscle as possible, to get as skinny as possible. So I can fit in the clothes that they were making. Uh, it's it's an unhealthy industry, which is the reason why I stepped out. Yeah, but but, but why do you think it will ever change, Maxine? Because you know when you think about it, the average woman now in America, I think I read, is like five foot four and one hundred and seventy one pounds. Nobody's yeah. here is fitting into those clothes. So wh why why is that what they're still portraying? That, uh, that is it's the ideal. Because there's two categories of modeling. There's the commercial world, which you'll see like on TV and ads and commercial and prints and magazines. And there's the high fashion space. So when you're walking for Machino, Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, that's the world that I was in. I was on the runway scene, which is has been and has always been really on the skinny side. Um, and I personally don't see that changing and hasn't for many, many years. But the commercial space is changing, which is great. That's, you know, you can be very skinny on a vegan diet using the principles of calorie density and still be very healthy if that's your goal. Absolutely. Which is why I do it the way that I do it now, because I did it the unhealthy way for many, many, many years. Right? Yeah. I've learned from my mistake, I've done the research, which is why we're like, why we do it the way that we do basically. So Janet is commenting, but hemp is so high in fat though, but it's the good fats. It's the omega threes. Yes. But if you grab the hemp protein, right? So like I mentioned, we talk about eating foods that are not processed, right? So if you grab hemp seeds and you press them, cold press them, right? Meaning really slowly, you squeeze the, the, all the oil out of them, the meal that is left over from it, that is, that is hemp protein. So you just removed all the fat from the hemp seed and you're only left with the protein and the fiber, right? So that's what hemp protein is. I, so you can get that like, just like at, at a regular health food store. Cause yeah, I have a whole food that. store a, a, any store that, that you have around you will have hemp, will have hemp protein. And it's one of the best one as a 95%, I believe rate of absorption. It's pea protein. Um, a lot of companies will heat 
We'll heat them. We'll use hexane to extract the protein from it. So it's dead protein basically, because they heated all the vitamins and nutrients out of it. Yeah. So hemp is definitely one of the best ones. That's very cool. I used to work in the hemp space for three years. So I, so I know a lot about <laughs> hemp. Uh, I saw something. I saw a question. Um, Trisha asks, I've been whole food plant-based for a year and recently had a DEXA scan. The result is very low bone minerals compared to my age group of 67 years old, osteopenia. Yep. I was told to take calcium supplements. What is your advice? I walk four miles a day and do some weightlifting. That would, that sounds like it might be the ideal kind of client for you because you can really help people build their bone density on a vegan diet. Absolutely. So, um, obviously eating foods that are going to be high in calcium and whole food plant-based space would be a good place to go. Supplementation is, you know, it's a supplement. It's meant as an addition to everything else that you're doing. So we need to make sure that you're doing everything in your power to enhance that bone density. The big thing is you mentioned your strength training, right? So I would ask how consistently, how often per week, is there any progression to your strength training? I actually want to share that with your viewers also, because bone density was a, a big topic the last time that I came on. So I kind of want to explain the process a little bit of how you build stronger bones, right? So you have your initial bone and when you put, when you do bone bearing activities, so including strength training, when you're in the gym, there's a process called osteoblast and osteoclast. So osteoblast is like dumping cement on the sidewalk, right? You're just adding more to it. And osteoclast is basically making it smooth so that you can walk on it. So every time you do bone bearing activity, that process happens inside of your body on your bones. You do bone bearing activity, you're going to do some, some squats, some push ups, some curls, some shoulder presses. There's going to be an additional layer that's going to be dumped on top of it and then smooth it out. And over time, you build a stronger bone. And so what's going to make that process faster is obviously eating a, a whole food plant-based diet with an emphasis on foods that would be higher in calcium. Uh, but definitely the progression of your strength training will make the world of a difference because as your bone gets stronger, it needs more tension to become stronger, right? So ensuring that there's a progression is a part that a lot of people miss in their strength training program, because they do the same thing for months and months on end. And you need to change it every four weeks or so. Nice. Very good. Thank you. Oh, um, oh, I think one of your coaches might be watching Nicole, because yes. she said the vegan fit blueprint provides meal plans tailored to each person that comes in, that comes in. End of sentence. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> Nicole. Thanks for jumping on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool. How do, do you train your coaches or do they come to you already, you know, as coaches? Uh, mixture of both. So we definitely have our way of doing things. We have really, we have a proven system for, for success. And so we, our members come in with having their certification and being ready to coach, but then we teach them how to do it the fit vegan way. Nice. I love it. Yeah. The fit vegan way. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Catherine. Ari exercise for people with knee problems. I'm 64 with meniscus damage and rheumatoid arthritis who can't do much in the way of impact. Do you recommend natto N A T T O? I think that's a food made out of. Yeah. Soil. Natto is a, is like a, it's not fermented. It's, is it? It's like a, the higher version of tempeh. It's like there's tofu, tempeh and natto. Um, Honestly, if it agrees with your body and doesn't cause any issue in terms of the food, if you eat the food and it makes you feel a certain way where you don't feel comfortable, potentially I would cut it out. The big part I wanted to share is if there's any issues that you have with food or any deficiencies that you may think you may have, just test. Just test to see where your deficiencies are. It's way better than doing any guesswork, right? Um, so that's going to make a make a, the world of a difference. In terms of nacho, if you eat it and you feel good, there's nothing wrong with it. It's highly bioavailable. It's really easy to digest. So if you're fine with it, then that's great. Where do you even get it? I've heard of it and I, I might've had it. I'm allergic to soy, but I'm thinking many years ago, but where, yeah. where does one get natto? I've personally never seen any in a store. You have to buy it like online. I found some on Amazon. I've never seen them in any health food store or, or on Amazon or anything. Um, so yeah, definitely you gotta do a lot of research in order to be able to find it. Wow. Thanks. Uh, Marianne says, what do you think about concrete HCL and nitric oxide? Not sure if you know what that is. Yeah. Uh, so concrete HCL. So is that, would that be like the creatine version? Cause I know there's a brand that's called that. So if, if, if what this person is referring to is, is creatine, um, if you are wanting to go down the road of creatine, which will help your body produce more ATP, which is, is your body's preferred source of energy, Grab a, v a vegan creatine monohydrate. 
right? All the rest is just a marketing scam. <laughs> they don't do much for you. They don't, they don't do a lot. There's not a lot of studies backing those up. Um, so that's what I would say for vegan creatine monohydrate. And the other one was nitric oxide, right? So there is nitric oxide supplements, but if you want a natural form of it, eat a beet, juice a beet, drink some beet juice, right? So there's nitrate in it, which is a precursor to nitric oxide. So it'll help your body produce more naturally. And simply what that does when you're working out is it helps with the blood flow to the muscle. So you get a better muscle contraction. You can properly engage the muscle. So yeah, I drink some beet juice, eat some beet. There's some beet powder that you can get. Like that would be the, the healthiest natural version that you can go for. Great. Uh, somebody's remarking, and I, I, I don't know how to pronounce this name, but you look like Sam Hugan from Outlander. I guess that's an actor. I, I, I will him. look, I will look into him. <laughs> I Googled him, but I got to say you're better looking, or at least for the picture that I found of him. And oh, sorry, you. Sam, if I botched your name. Here's a comment from somebody in your program named A. Herzog. I started Fit Vegan six weeks ago, lost 10 pounds already. Fantastic. Congratulations. I'm 61, 10 years post-surgical menopause with two artificial knees. This program is exceptional, very supportive and motivational members and coaches. Sounds wonderful. Thank you for sharing your experience. And there's, I'm sure there's information because if you gave it to me right below on the yeah. show notes, people want to, want to, to check it out. Okay. Stephanie says, what are your thoughts on wearing a weight vest for a bit each day for bone health? Um, yeah, it, that would be considered a bone bearing activity, right? So the only thing I would say to that is, um, make sure that over time you increase, right? So if you're, I'm just going to assume this person is going on a hike or walking around the house or wants to do things like that. There's nothing wrong like that. That would be considered bone bearing activity. Right. You, you have to, if you look at the, the bone density of, of people that tends to be overweight, they tend to have a better bone density, right? Uh, it's a mix of both because there's bad nutrition, which could lead to like weaker bones, but in terms of bone bearing activity, they're carrying more weight. So they do have naturally stronger bones because of that. So which exercises are weight bearing and which aren't? I know that sounds like a simplistic question, but I think, I, I think people need it to really explain because things like swimming and yoga may be really great, but they may not be built to build bone density, right? Yeah. Well, you're definitely removing all the gravity when, when, when you're going to be swimming, but it's a great cardiovascular, uh, cardio, cardiovascular exercise. Um, so focusing on the main compound movements, right? So we would be looking at a squat. We would be looking at a deadlift, a bench press or a push up, a pull up or a chin up. If you have access to a gym, there is uh, a chin up assisted machines will remove some weight from you so that you can do the full movement and then you can like remove some of the plates and it, uh, it, it removes weight. So it makes it like easier for you as you're doing the exercise. So it's a great way for you to ease your way into performing these movements. Bench press can be replaced with a push up. a squat with a barbell can be replaced with a body weight squat. If you want to get started, a deadlift could be, you know, with a barbell at the gym or simply you being in your living room and deadlifting your couch. Right. When, when first uh, COVID got hit, people had to be really creative with how they found weights. And so if you don't have access to a gym, my, my go-to was uh, Ikea reusable grocery bags because they're, they're really sturdy. And I would either put some books, some cans of beans in there. I would put some bricks or some rocks and I would use that for my weights. Anything your, your body doesn't know if it's a dumbbell, a kettlebell, a barbell, a bag full of books, it just knows gravity, right? So whatever form of resistance you can apply, it'll work for your body. That's cool. So I um, just want to make a comment to Ruby. She says, I never see the beginning of the videos. I hope I can watch a replay for anyone who comes in late. You can watch with us. And then right when it's over, you can start at the beginning, just so you know. So Amy comments, almost all elderly white women are diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia. Do, do you think that's true? Because I think, I mean, my, my mom was obese. She didn't have it. She, she had great bone density. Everything else was wrong, but her bone density was really good. Yeah. I wouldn't say that it's a thing that I heard of often. I, it would be hard for me to, to confirm that. But if you really think about it, when it comes to, to bone loss, you know, dairy had a big role to play into that because it just leaches calcium out of the bones. And so if you think back of, you know, 50, 60 years ago, what was the main marketing thing to strengthen your bones? It was dairy. Right. And so I, I would see potentially that would be the correlation there. Um, but I've never heard of it like being a thing up until this day. Mm. A couple of people are asking again, what natto is and Jesse's saying in her natural food store locally, they keep it in a refrigerated section with the esoteric items. Yeah. It's very gooey. It's like a soybean, but it's very 
like gooey is, is the word that comes up with. Yeah. <laughs> so Pat says, do you have members that are over 70 that have built big muscles? Um, I was going to say, I think our oldest member would be 74, I believe. Um, and it's always possible to build more muscle. It just comes down to training and nutrition, right? If you, if you look around it into society, I'm sure you can find a ton of them, people that are 70 in their eighties being in the best shape than when they were 50, because they decided to turn their life around. It's always possible for you to become healthier, to build stronger bones and to build more muscle. It simply comes down to having the right protocol in place. The only reason why you're not where you want to be is this step of action hasn't been there yet. And so once we put that into place over time, you'll get there, but it's definitely like, it's just a game plan that's missing. And I, I like to say blueprint. That's how I call my program, the fit vegan blueprint. You're just missing the blueprint. Once you have it and you go through it, you'll get there regardless of your age. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, maybe you're, since you're coming on again, and by the way, some people are saying, well, where's Dr. McDougal? So instead of McDougal Monday, this is Maxime Monday. He graciously yes. agreed to step in because Dr. McDougal came on an extra time last month and he wants to give his talk on a different Monday, which will be Labor Day. So we look forward to having him then. So maybe next time you come on, maybe have some of your clients and with you, or maybe some of your coaches, that'd be kind of cool to hear from them. Uh, is it possible to bring them on Zoom? Yes, as long as oh, the, yes, perfect. it's we could have. I, I think I'm up to 500. So hopefully you don't have more than 500. <laughs> no, that's I'll, I'll definitely do. bring on some members and coaches for sure. Yeah, that could be a kind of fun way because I think you are the last one at Cheek Week, so that will be fun. And then you got to figure out how we're going to do this because you're you're donating with your own money, not Breville, like a $500 air fryer. So everybody's we know it's going to watch that episode. We got to figure out the parameters of of who's going to win. It'll be wonderful. Absolutely. So, Kristen says, what do you recommend for yo-yo dieters? How do you keep the weight from coming back by doing what you did to lose it? I think, but I'll let Maxime take that one. Yeah. So a great question, Kristen. Um, the big part is once you've done the fat loss and there's many different ways to do the fat loss, you hear about a ton of them online. The big part that I ask is you do it in a way that is sustainable for you. If you use, for example, you do keto and you absolutely hate every second of it, there's a high likelihood that once it's done, you'll be like, yes, I'm out of jail. Let me eat the actual way that I want to eat. And so what we preach to our members is let's make sure the fat loss is sustainable. You're eating in a way that you see yourself eating for the rest of your life. Now, once you've done losing the weight, then you have to do something called reverse dieting. Reverse dieting takes about three months. It's where we speed up your metabolism post fat loss. So we slowly re-increase food every single week, right? Depending on how your body is adjusting and compensating for it. The analogy that I like to use to clearly explain that is if you went camping before and there's a little fire and, you know, you start off your fire, have a small flame. That's how your metabolism is after a fat loss, right? It naturally slowed down as you go into calorie deficit, as you start to lose weight, it's normal. But how do you re-increase? How do you make that flame bigger? When you go camping, you throw a little bit of wood in there and then that flame gets a little bit bigger and then a little bit more wood and a little bit more wood, and a little bit more wood. So that's basically what we do with reverse dieting is we slowly re-add food every single week to allow that flame to get bigger and bigger and bigger until you have a raging fire that can burn through anything. Um, most of our members are able to add a thousand plus calories to their daily food intake to sustain their new body, whether that is a 10 pound fat loss, a 40 pound fat loss, or a 70 pound fat loss, they're able to add a thousand plus calories to their daily food intake to sustain the new body. So that's how you do it. That's how you stop the yo-yo dieting process because what creates yo-yo dieting is you lose the weight. You go back to eating normally too quickly. You put the weight back on and then, you know, six months on the line, you do another cut and then you do the same thing after. So reverse dieting is the key and is the only way known right now in this lifetime to stop that process. There's no other way to do it. I've never heard that term reverse dieting before. Yeah, it's, it's literally the only solution. I just recorded a podcast with an uh, ex-military that has his doctorate in, um, in, in nutrition, and he's in the same space as I am. And it was like, there's no other way to get out of a fat loss phase to speed up your metabolism and to ensure that you keep the new body. There's no, there's no other method. There's no other like drug or pill or food that you can eat that would complete that process besides doing reverse dieting. Oh, thanks. James says, is, I came in late, sorry, is 100% pure he writes creative, but I think he must mean creatinine. Okay. Yeah. So I just like creatine. So yeah, just vegan creatine monohydrate. Make sure it's vegan because most creatines aren't vegan. Um, Veg Nutrition has a vegan one, a really good one. They also have like lion's mane mushroom in there, um, which is really good. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, what about rebounding for bone density? Asks Cindy. 
I think that came up in the last live also for, for rebounding. Um, if you're comfortable with it, yes. All right. But if you have uh, a lot of inflammation, you have a lot of knee pain or joint pain, I would say no, but if it doesn't hurt your body, I don't see any issues with that. Right. So I'm just assuming like on a trampoline, like I've seen some of those, yeah, those like classes, those little, little, you know, they're, they're not this, that. Yeah, they're, they're more like for home. The ones I've seen are, you know, smaller for home use rather than like, I think the trampolines that you see, like at those yeah. sky places that, yeah, they- I, I had one at home. Um, I would just say the big thing is it won't produce the same result as if you were to do strength training or add bone bearing activity, it would help, but not the same as strength training. But the added benefit is you're moving your lymphatic system, right? When you're jumping on the trampoline. So it helps to kind of flush out those toxins from the body. So there's a great benefit to, to rebounding. Great. Thanks. Catherine, who's watching live says natto supposedly stops your blood leaching protein from your bones and prevents osteoporosis. It's gooey. So it's not everyone's cup of tea, but you can find it in Asian grocery stores in the freezer section. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank it looks you. less than appealing when you yeah. Google it. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't sound like my cup of tea, but you know, yeah. to each his own. Ruby wants to know what whole food plant-based foods help build back osteopenic bones. I would say that I would have to provide you a list. Let me do a bit of research and provide you a list. I don't want to give false information, information I'm not sure about. So I definitely would have to go back and do some more research to provide that. Okay. Thank you. Well, you're coming on again, so you can, you can put that on your list. And a couple of people said they've already downloaded your free guide and that link is in the show notes, but I can also put it in the chat for people that don't want to go to the show notes, which are right below this video. So uh, that was Dave who just signed up for the free yeah. guide on the website. Can he I says, for the thank guide? You. Yep. He what? says, thank you. And uh, uh, Ch- Chana wants to know how they can, she can obtain information on your program. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm sure there's a link down below also, but fitvegan.ca or fitvegancoaching.com. You can go on there. There's a little video that explains like, how, how we do things. There's testimonials for members. You can kind of see some of the transformation. One thing to note is everything is 100% whole food plant-based. We don't use any fake meat or fake cheese. So just go into that website. You can book a free call with our fit vegan goal setting coaches. And we have a conversation and see, you know, if we would be a good fit. Because at the end of the day, I really want to help people thrive. And we need to make sure that people are, are ready and in a position to, to do that work. Um, and one thing I would say about the guide also is the last time that I was on, it was the main questions that I got is how to build muscle, get lean and strengthen your bones. So I just wrote a whole ebook on that specific topic. Cause it feel like that what was most needed when I came on. And so, yeah, if you guys enjoy that ebook, took me, <laughs> took me a while to write, but hopefully you get the value that, that you need. That's terrific. Well, I just actually put it also in the chat. So they'll make it easier for them to click. Um, okay. Um, what is the accent I'm hearing? I, I, you sound a little French to me. I hear. I am. I'm, I'm French. I'm from Quebec, Canada. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It sound- comes out. It comes out sometimes. And so I'm guessing you speak French then. Yeah. Yeah. I speak French. That's cool. You could train people that speak French. Yeah, exactly. Well, we've had a, a few members from Quebec come into the program. Um, yeah. My, my French is rough though, because I've been operating in English for, for many, many years, but I, I still have it. Nice. That's I, I, I think it never leaves you if you're talking to somebody that, that speaks French. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Mona says, what about resistance bands? Yep. Resistance band. Like I mentioned, gravity is gravity. So whatever form of resistance you can have, whether that is in a resistance band form, whether that is reusable grocery bags with books or cans of beans in there, that works perfectly fine. As long as you're fighting against gravity, that will create resistance. So resistance band are a great place to start. They're, I think like 15, the one I get my members to get if they don't have a gym is 15 bucks on Amazon. And they've been able to lose like 20, 30, 50 pounds just with a $15 band, right? Comes down to the structure and applying that resistance. That's amazing. Julie says weightlifting has really changed the look of my body. So that's very cool. Um, And so there's another question about the effectiveness of resistance bands. So they can actually build muscle. Um, yes, definitely. I'll, I'll put a disclaimer on this slower than if you're in a gym simply because it's really hard to get a higher amount of resistance on a resistance band, right? Compared to if you have 20, you know, if you want to go up to 40 pound dumbbells for an exercise to get a band that would go to that heavy makes it really hard. The other component about a resistance band, if you got to think that it only creates more resistance as it's being stretched. So let's just say you're doing a bicep curl. There's no tension here, a little bit more here, a little bit more here, more here, and then more here. 
versus if you have a dumbbell, it's 20 pounds here, it's 20 pounds here, it's 20 pounds here, all the way through, right? And so the, the amount of resistance changes as you stretch the band. So great place to start if you're more serious about wanting to put on muscle um, and you're just getting started, start with bands, get to a place where you're conquering the bands and then you can go to the gym. Well, okay. When you lifted your arm up, I saw some triangles. What does that mean? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, it's on this arm. It's, my camera is reversed. Um, explore, learn, understand, create, and transform. So there's two meaning to this tattoo. Um, one is I was living um, in Mont Tremblant in Quebec, and those are the lessons that I learned when I was living there. The other meaning to that is I found this on Pinterest. Um, and I was at a time of my life where a lot of things were happening and just came to the real realization that everything in life has the meaning that you decide to give it to it. So that's the meaning that I gave to it. And that's what it means to me, right? Wow. When an event comes up into your life, you get to choose the meaning. Ultimately, if it's good or bad, that's your decision. Wow. Do you ever miss your modeling days? Uh, no, no, not at all. I, I, I like what I do a lot more. I get to have an actual impact in, in people's life and in their health. Like I mentioned, I lost a lot of people to, to cancer and chronic disease in my life. And to me, it's a huge passion of mine. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Um, and I don't want anyone to be in that position because I saw what it's like to be in that position. And uh, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. I wouldn't, if, yeah, there's nothing else I would do. <laughs> this is the only thing I like. Do you have like your old portfolios or anything like that? I mean, I'm just wondering, do you, is, are your pictures, I'd love to see your pictures because I bet they're great. Yeah, I do. I think they're, they might be in Quebec. Cause I've traveled a lot. I'm, I'm located in LA now, but for now I'm located in LA, but I, I keep everything at my parents' house because it's the most stable address I have. So they definitely have all my modeling books and, and my com cards. Wow. Well, you still look pretty young. I mean, you could still do it if you wanted to, right? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I made a promise to myself when I got out of that space because they don't want you to smile, right? It's very like they control everything about your image. <laughs> they don't want you to smile. That's hilarious. Now, for, for high fashion, you can't smile. They want to control like your hair, uh, how you look. They have a full control over because that's what the business is, right? It's fully physical. And so when I left, I was like, you know what? I'm going to create my own empire where I get to impact the lives of people. And if there is going to be a photo shoot, it will be because of the impact that I've had in the world. And they want me on a cover for something. And I can smile all I want because I like smiling. Yeah, like a vegan magazine. That's what I'm thinking. Like print work where, you you know, yeah, there used well, to be a, a magazine. Brenda Carey had vegan health and fitness. And so maybe they'll maybe there is a vegan magazine we can get you on the cover of. Yeah, I would love that. Definitely. Okay. As long as I can have more impact in the vegan space and people's lives, that's all I want. I will work on it. I can be your agent. Okay. Thank you. So Ronan says, is it true that it's important to consume protein short, shortly after finishing a workout? Great question. So that would be dependent on if you ate before. Um, so a lot of people will do fasted workout. They'll do it fasted workout first thing in the morning. If you do a fasted workout first thing in the morning, and you don't eat and you don't consume any food. Definitely within, you know, 15 minutes after a workout, you do want to consume a source of carbohydrate and protein simply because you didn't really eat any food until dinner the night before. And so in terms of having enough amino acids and glycogen in your body to repair the muscle, there's nothing there. It went away on your night of sleep. And then you wake up and you're completely empty. If you had a breakfast before you went through your workout or your lunch or whatever other meal, then there's no rush. You can wait like two, three hours after a workout to eat. If you had a meal that contained some carbohydrates and protein before, That's it's only great. important if you're fasted before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, you know, I hear different things from different people about whether you should eat before you work out, but I never could do anything if I have food in me. It just, it just, I always get nauseous if I try to do, whether it's yoga or spinning, if I, yeah. it, it just feels not good to me. Yeah. It, it, for me, I would say it depends what type of exercise you're doing and when you're doing it. And so when I used to train for Ironman and I would go on a four hour bike ride, um, I didn't like to have a big meal inside of me because I'm leaning down on my bike like this and I'm bent over and it just felt really uncomfortable. Right. So for me, I always like to keep it light and stop eating maybe two, two and a half hours before my bike ride. So I felt light and empty and I could do my bike ride. If I'm doing a heavy strength training session, I like to have a meal about like an hour and a half to an hour before, cause I like to have that strength. If you're working out first thing in the morning, right. You got to think of the digestion time also. So just say you want to go to gym at six you need at least an hour to digest. That means you have to finish eating by, you know, uh, sorry, an hour before. So at 6 a.m., you train at 7. You got to finish eating at 6. That means you got to wake up probably like 5.15 so you can do a workout at 7 a.m. So if that fits within your schedule, go for it. But if you're someone that wakes up and wants to work out right away, 
don't try to squeeze in food. You don't have time to digest before your workout. I work out in the evening. So I obviously have a few meals in me by, by the time I get there. Nice. Uh, Amy says her dentist told her that he thoroughly researched this, that, that, that bone density tests really don't tell us how strong or weak the bones are. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I know that Dr. McDougall doesn't put a lot of stock in them as far as um, that, because I think they're skewed towards people that aren't eating the way we are, just like all yeah. the blood tests and all the other tests are. So most anyway. of the stuff isn't tailored for us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dave says, would a piece of exercise equipment like a total gym be useful to gain muscle? Um, total gym. I don't know what that brand is and what it entails. I'm just going to assume that it's something with the pulleys and you have some cables and some bars. Yes. As long as you can have enough resistance to trigger muscle growth, right. To create some resistance where it's hard for you to perform the exercise, you'll be more than fine. Great. Uh, Sarah says, how flexible is your plan? What about vacations, social obligations? Yeah. So when it comes to vacation, social obligations, the big part we want to do is when those events come up, they're a great learning opportunity for you to learn to navigate how to make right decisions when you're in those situations. Because if you don't have guidance and support throughout these times, you're just going to revert back to your old ways of doing things. And the old ways of doing things brought you to where you are. And if you want to be in a different place, we have to operate differently. And so if there's a, a holiday, a social event, a family party, all that we ask is that you are within your calorie range that you're supposed to have for that meal, right? The decision as to the quality of food, we leave that up to you. But we also like to preface that if you are going to have foods that are not so good for you, you might not feel so good the next day, right? And so over time, our members see like, oh, I can have 500 calories at this family dinner. And then they have 500 calories of processed food. They feel terrible the next day. And then the next time they have the opportunity to kind of navigate freely their meal, they're like, okay, last time I didn't feel that great when I made that decision. How can I operate differently in this scenario so that I can feel good after? And so it's a, it's a continuous learning curve, but there is a lot of freedom. Our members travel all the time. We have a lot of people that travel for work. We have people that live out of hotels because they travel so much. Weddings, it's the wedding season for summer. We had a ton of people. So all that we ask is that you are within your metrics for the day. And we obviously give you guidelines for you to, you know, stay on track with everything. Great. Uh, Kristen says, I've lost 47 pounds with Maxime and 80% of my workouts are with resistance bands. Yeah. Yeah. Kristen has been crushing it. Um, you know, we include cardio, which I like to call hard training because that's basically what it is. We include some cardio in our workout plans, but they are there as a tool, not there as the base, right? The base is always strength training because that's what makes a difference in actually changing your body. Nice. Uh, you might not be able to answer this because I know you're not a doctor. Pumpkin asks, any advice for people who have to be on a liquid diet due to gastric outlet obstruction and possible gastroparesis? I will definitely stay on my lane in this one. I apologize. I cannot, I cannot speak on that. Yeah. Great. I love when people say what they don't know when they don't know. Yeah. Lily says, what do you think about a Pilates machine to strengthen bone? Because I remember taking a Pilates class once where we were actually, it was a jumping class, but we were laying down. It was kind of bizarre. Yeah. I, I've tried some Pilates before. It was a really hard class. It's really like props to people that do Pilates is really hard. Again, as long as there's resistance, that's what will create that, you know, that bone bearing activity, whether that is with bands, with Pilates, with a backpack, with books in them, like whatever, as long as there's resistance, that's how you're going to do it. Nice. So let's see. Uh, Catherine says, wow, resistance bands could be the answer to no impact. Absolutely. Yeah. Really easy on the joints also. Um, and you get to control the form of tension a lot more easily than if you have dumbbells. Because if you have the dumbbells where you have to interchange at your home, it takes time to go in between them. But the band, you simply change the position of your footing and then it'll just adjust the resistance for you. Yeah, it's a great place to start. Every time I've ever had physical therapy, which has been a lot from my head to yeah. my toe, that's what they always use. They always use resistance bands. I've never seen them actually use weights. So yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely softer and forces you to have more control because obviously the band's going to be like pulling you down, right? In whatever movement you're doing. And very transportable. Yes, yeah. Yeah, cheaper on the luggage if you're flying. Absolutely. <laughs> Elizabeth says, does heavy lifting cause hernia? Um, if you're not lifting properly, you're not strengthening your core properly. So the big part that we ask, especially for all our members, that's why we invite them to watch the videos, to send us videos of them performing the exercise is, um, if you, you need to keep a good form, if a hernia is going to be caused is because you tried to lift in a way where your form was giving out and you forced everything you had in your body to get that weight up. We don't recommend our members do that is if you're deadlift, I can think would be the, the biggest one or like a squat. 
if you're doing a deadlift, you're pulling your weight off the ground and your back is curving and you're kind of twisting left and right to try to get the weight up, which the body is always going to try to find the path of least resistance, then you're going to be prone to injury, right? So if you do the right form and you go to lift it by keeping the right form and you can't lift it anymore, it means it's too heavy, right? It means the body's done. So it means we need to remove a little bit of the weight and perform with it with the right movement. And so if you're giving out on your form and you're forcing it to go up, then yeah, you're obviously more likely to, to get injured. Um, but the weight is again, in talking about, I'm not saying that in this area, that's what it is, but ego lifting is a big thing in the gym, right? We're trying to lift heavy because we're with a friend or we see other people. Um, it's completely irrelevant, right? I I've seen some, some professional bodybuilders curl less weight than my friends who's skinnier than me but he was had proper muscle contraction. He was focusing on the right form. You're going to get more growth out of that and strength than if you have the wrong form because you're working the muscle improperly. Great. Thank you. Ruby says, I'm rehabbing from two rotator cuff repair surgeries. How can I build bone density now with weights? And I wanted to ask you for myself, like, I'd love to take your program, but my right arm, I basically can't use it. I don't want to get into my medical stuff, but mm. torn rotator cuff, elbow injury and, and uh, trigger thumb. It's like, I, I can't grab. And yeah. every time I've tried to do weights, I just end up getting more injured because of this arm just doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Yeah. So the big part is once you, we would jump on the initial call and have a call with the coach, we would do an assessment of what that looks like and what kind of movements you can do. But for example, on, um, on a curl, for example, you don't necessarily have to hold the weight, right? There's straps that you can wear that you can attach to a cable pulley and do the curl this way where the tension is here instead of you holding a weight. All right. So there's many different ways to, to get around it. Big part is if you're recovering from an injury and it's preventing you from performing bigger movements, complete the recovery first. There's no need to rush back into it because if you delay the recovery process by two to three weeks, that's two to three weeks that you can't really do anything, right? But if you do have limitation, we, we have members with torn rotator cuffs, fused spines with the hip replacement, and we've been able to navigate and make those adjustments for them. It's very much on like a base of, on a, like a case to case basis. But yeah, for, for you, Chef AJ, we definitely like, we just have an assessment and look at what are the movements that you can perform, where is the pain and what's causing it. And then we can we can tailor the exercise around that. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Kay says, I had a DEXA, can, DEXA scan and it showed below normal bone density. For two years, I focused more on weight-bearing exercise. I got one again and my bone density increased. Well, that's great. No, so, you know, you can change things. That's fantastic. Beautiful. What, yeah. Ronnie says, can extreme flabby underarms actually become firm with exercise? I feel hopeless. Like, shouldn't, shouldn't a tricep be here? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> So two things to that, yes, building more muscle will make the world of a difference. But the other part you have to think of is, if, is that if it is looser here, is that there's fat there. And the only way to get rid of it is nutrition is going to be a, a play a key role in that. And so decreasing your body fat, which you can't target specifics, you can't target just losing fat here. Genetically, your body will lose fat in the way that it does, right? There's nothing we can do about that. All we can do is decrease the overall body fat. Some people lose it in the stomach first, some in, in the butt first, some in the arms first. Like I lose arms. That's like my face is my first one, second is my arms. So decreasing overall body fat and then focusing on strength training to build the muscle, to fill out the skin. Um, and that will get rid of it. Great. Thanks. All right. Um, but I'm bum. Uh, Randy says, is there a certain type of yoga to increase bone density? I, I'll be honest. I'm yoga is not my space. Um, I've done some before, but definitely not an answer that I could throw in. But what I would say is do some strength training and then have a yoga routine during the week, because it's great for mobility and flexibility, which is what I know yoga to, to be known for, right? That's what I use it for. But again, you would have to create, we go back to the basics. How do you create additional resistance on your bones through yoga? There needs to be like logically a weight or pressure on you. And I don't know of any yoga that you would have to do with weights or with like added pressure on you. Yeah. I don't know, Maxime, like I got the cardio down pat. I spend an hour every day. I got the yoga down pat. I can do the splits. I'm flexible. But mm. when it comes to weights, I just like, blah, 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 blah. I just think it's so boring. Yeah. So there, there's ways to make it entertaining. But the big thing I've noticed is I've had a lot of my members that didn't strength train. They were on the same path of loving to do their cycling and their running and their hiking. 
and had a bit of a, a hate relationship with strength training, but it all turned around once they started their body, once they started to see their body become stronger and they started to feel the strength that comes with it. Then it changes to like, oh, this feels nice. This feels great. I feel strong right now. And then they have a love for, for strength training. I would say, oh, I would say at least 70% of my members hated strength training before they got started. And now they all love it because they saw what it could bring to their body. Cardio is great. Yoga is great. Um, it's definitely about like getting yourself some results so that you can see how it feels. And then everyone's hooked. I haven't had someone that got stronger that wasn't hooked on it. Well, well I, I mean, the results of it are phenomenal. You know, when people do it, like the results, the way they look at any way that you can tell, it's just, it's, they're phenomenal. Yeah. I just wish I could be bit by that bug if there was one. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, Angela says, what, what? I was going to say like, maybe like a, a month or two on it. Once your body starts to get that coordination with being able to perform some of these movements, I, I promise you, you would see a big difference in your overall energy throughout the day and how strong you feel. You'd see a difference when you're cycling, when you're hiking, when you're performing your yoga, there'd be so much more in control of your body. And then it becomes a little bit addicting to be like, oh yeah, I feel good. I feel strong. Yeah. I like this. Now, I think it's just a matter of like the mindset with me or with anybody, you know, once you make up your mind to do it and, to, and, and then you see the results, I think, then I think you're right. Yeah. Um, Angela says, is it safe to say that my son is less likely to break a bone if he eats more plant-based? There are so many voices that still insist on competition, athletic kids eating animal products. I personally would say yes to that. There's so much study backing like that eating whole food plant-based will give you stronger bones. All right. I wouldn't say like, I, I don't, I wouldn't, I personally don't back anything that the dairy industry or that any of those marketing firms would back up in terms of strengthening bone because we've debunked it so long ago and there's so many studies on that. And I, I understand that there's a difference between the scientific world and like the society that we live in and the peer pressure and the marketing that takes place. At the end of the day, when it comes to yourself as a person, I have no issues having a conversation, but when it comes to your kids, that is a, you know, a parent's decision as to what they feel comfortable with. But from my point of view, when I am in that position, I'm exactly going to take the road of whole food plant base. Thanks. Uh, so a question here. Yes. Aaron says, every time I strength train, I am always really sore. Am I working too hard? How much soreness is normal? Yeah. So if you, that's a good question, you, if you're new to it, you're going to be sore. Um, if you've had a good workout, as long as it's not debilitating to your life, soreness is normal. You've just applied a lot of pressure. You just tore muscle fibers that are trying to repair. I've been working out for the past 17 years and I've been sore for the past 17 years. <laughs> it's, it's not a soreness that is debilitating. You just, you just get used to it. It's normal because you're pushing your body to become stronger and build more muscle. The big role is going to be the two things for your recovery. I say three things for recovery, nutrition, making sure you're getting sufficient amount of energy and vitamins and nutrients to fulfill your recovery uh, as long, along with protein. Second, a good night of sleep. A good night of sleep plays a massive role in your amount of recovery and your level of soreness you're going to feel the next day. And the third one is stretching. Stretching post-workout will greatly reduce the DOMS, which is delayed onset muscle soreness, which is basically the soreness you're feeling after a strength training session. If you stretch, you will greatly reduce DOMS. Um, and then, yeah, like I mentioned, sleep and nutrition are the three big things that will make a difference in how sore you're feeling the next day. Wow. Okay. Hurts so good, right? Yes. Uh, Jerry said she pulled a, a muscle using or in her thumb. It sounds like using resistance bands. Hmm. Pulling a muscle. So a big part of like pulling a muscle, there's a few things that come into that. If you're performing abrupt movement, right, you're not in control of the weight. So you're using resistance band, for example, on a curl, naturally, like the band will pull you down. And so if you don't control it or you let it pull you down and you're trying to stop it, right, you're more likely to pull a muscle. The other component is, like I mentioned, stretching plays a vital role in reducing the amount of soreness, but also reducing your risk of injury. If there is a lack of mobility and flexibility in the muscle, your range of motion gets shortened and you're more likely to get injured, right? So stretching and being mobile plays a key role in being able to reduce your risk of injury. Wow. So is I spin in, I spin only spin standing. Is there, yeah. is there any um, impact or bone? You, you know what I'm trying? I never sit on the seat. I never have yeah. for over 10 years now. So is that, yeah. is that better for me in terms of anything I'm trying to accomplish? Well, it's not hurting. I would say it's helping more 
All right. It would never hurt for you to, to be standing and be performing any type of exercise. Cause when you think about it, you're basically doing small leg presses because you're technically applying pressure against the resistance of the bike. Right. So that is, that is creating some resistance in that when you're, when you're standing, you're putting a bigger emphasis on your quads, depending on how you're standing. When you're sitting down, you're putting a bigger emphasis on your hamstrings and your glutes. Uh, that's why my quads are always so sore. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, if you, if you look at cyclists that bike uphill, they, most of the time they don't stand up when they're going uphill they trying to stay seated as long as possible simply because the glute and the hamstring are the biggest muscle in the, in, the, in the body right so it takes a lot more to tire them out the quad is so small compared to the glute and the and the, your basically the back of your leg and your butt for those who are not too familiar with the term your butt and the back of your leg is such a big muscle it takes a lot to tire them out so when you look at cyclists that are racing they trying to stay seated down as much as possible because your quads they get burnt out really quickly it's interesting because I, I feel like my calves are just getting so big from spinning. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause there is a little bit of the movement, right. As you're pedaling at the bottom like this. Yeah. Cause I spin at a really, I spin at the highest resistance I can, which my okay. bike goes up to 24. And right now I'm at 20, not 21. I haven't been able to get really past 21. What's your cadence when you're biking? I, I, I don't know what that means. Oh, okay. Rhythm... It's like uh, how many circles do you do per minute? So I think Good it's like the RPM or something like that. Yeah, on, on I don't, I'm not spinning fast. I, I, I'm okay. not spinning fast, but I'm spinning, okay. you know, I'm, I, I just, I just don't like going fast, but I yeah. do sweat a lot. I, I mean, I, something's happening because yeah. my, my lower body, when people say you're so skinny on the show, but then they see me in person, like, I, I mean, I'm not a big girl, but I mean, I got big leg muscles. Yeah. From well, now that you're saying that, so we like to say when you're cycling, it feels like sticky, like it's really heavy and it feels sticky when you're biking. Yes. That, that would help you with bone density because yeah, that's how I do it. It's like, it, it's, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not easy to get it around. So that would yeah. be great in terms of building strength, building that bone density, right? So most people, when they bike at that, they're around like a 50 to 60 cadence. So circles basically per minute. If you're trying to cycle efficiently, right? You want to bike as long as possible. You're looking at like a 90 RPM, right? So less resistance, but higher cadence. Um, yeah. But yeah, so what you're doing is great to like build you strong legs and like yeah. strengthen those well, cause, bones. Because I heard the Cher's eyes, uh, you know, the vegan neurologist husband and wife say that as far as preventing dementia, that the, the muscles in the legs are like the most important. That's what they said. Yeah. And you also training your legs helps to build muscle in the upper body as well when you train the upper body because of the hormone production that takes place. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Um, so Linda is watching and she says she's 78. She teaches step and weights with dumbbells intervals, and she knows she's helping her clients gain muscle. It feels good. Thank you for your work. She's vegan for 40, 34 years. Oh, and, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, she was actually voted for uh, one time, one year, world sexiest vegan over 50. So when you're 50, let me know, because I want to nominate you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably won't be for like another 20 years, but just, just let me know. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm still around. All yeah. right. So Janelle you says- You're vegan. We're going to look for like I'm, 150. I'm, I'm, of course, good. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Janelle says, if you continue to add higher weight to your weightlifting routine, at some point, do you hit a max weight? Um, yes, I feel like everyone has a natural strength and, and potential that they can reach up to. The bi biggest thing I would say in, in, in the way that I was explaining is if let's just say you're doing 12 to 15 reps, over time, you're going to become stronger and you will be able to increase that weight for 12 to 15 reps. I would say that is not the most efficient way of training. What you want to do is you want to vary the different types of muscle fiber you're training. So 12 to 15 would be considered muscular endurance, right? You can go into hypertrophy, which would be the size of the muscle, you know, like eight to 12 repetitions. And then there's strength, right? You'd be looking at the five to eight repetitions. And so varying between those different types of muscle fibers throughout the months, right? Like one month for one phase, one month for one type of muscle fiber, two months for one type of muscle fiber, and then varying it is going to allow you to gain more strength as an overall. But in terms of cap potential of strength, everyone has a natural limit as to how much they'll be able to go. Um, and I don't think most people will ever hit that unless you're actively training for like powerlifting to be the strongest version of yourself. Most people are just trained to be fit, fit and feel good. Yeah. I like that. Okay. I saw a question. Um, I'm, I don't remember who asked it, but I get their name in a minute, but Oh, here it is from a different Linda. What do you think about using kettlebells? Yeah. Again, great form of resistance. Your body doesn't know if it's a kettlebell, a dumbbell, a barbell, or a resistance band. All it knows is 
pressure from gravity that's coming in. So a kettlebell is a great one. If you like to use them, kettlebell swings are great overall body movement. There's a lot that you can do with kettlebells. Nice. And Diane says, is there a specific set of resistance bands you can recommend I buy? I'm at the beginner level and woefully out of shape. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of brands, I, I wouldn't necessarily have a brand simply because I tell my members to buy it on Amazon because they get it pretty much within a day or two. And every brand that's on Amazon is made from China and someone just put a different brand on it. So um, what I would say with the type of bands you want to get, you have some, you need the long ones, not the circle ones, right? You want to grab the long ones that have a hook at the end of each of them where you can change the handle between resistance band. Because a lot of them will have like a band with the handle attached to it. And then you're stuck to that band. So you want to buy the ones that have multiple colors that have like red, green, yellow, purple, blue ones, where you can attach the handle to different resistance band. That way you have a greater variety of resistance you can get. And, you know, last time I checked were around 15 bucks on Amazon. So just don't get the one where the handle is stuck to the band, get the one where you can change it. That way you'll have more variety because if you grab a weight that's heavy enough for you to do a squat, it might be too heavy for you to be to do a shoulder press, for example. Makes sense. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Linda, the first Linda that's 78 says, I have osteoarthritis and the doctor said I need a knee replacement, but I chose to jog on it instead. He said I could not jog, but it's working. Is this not usually possible? Oh, I, I think I would have to be careful as to, as to how to answer that going against a, a doctor's recommendation who has all the data as for, as for her knees. But I'd say like, I've heard a ton of stories like that. That's, that's what I would, I would say about that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Lisa says any recommendations on where to start when recovering from COVID? Uh, great question. So we obviously have had a lot of dealt with a lot of that for our members or, you know, the, over the past several years, um, big part is start easy. If you are someone that is actively strength training, um, I would say go back into the gym on your regular plan, but do about 50% of the weights that you normally do. Right. But make sure you're actually recovered, right? Because there's no need to try to come back early because you want to be active and then delay the, the healing process. So come back to the gym, do about 50% of the weights you want to do for one week. Um, maybe don't do cardio for your first week. And then the second week, start to include it slowly. Personally, it took me two weeks to get back properly into it after I got COVID. Um, and for our members, it tends to be around the same timeline. So, you know, be, be easy on yourself, right? What is what is two weeks out of your entire lifetime, right? It's better to, better to heal properly and not rush into it and just feel good after two weeks. Okay. Uh, somebody named Naomi is telling me to watch Yellowstone because that's when I, I only allow myself te television when I'm on the bike, you know, yeah. but I, I, but it's not on any of the platforms I have. So, um, do you My watch parents any told me about that show? So do you, do you have, do you, do you ever indulge in uh, viewing? Um, what's the latest one I watched with my girlfriend? I can't remember. We like, we watch like some outdoor stuff. I like the tiny home like shows on Netflix. I always wanted to have a tiny home at one point, which I'm sure I'll, I'll have, I'll own at one point. Um, I like the minimalist documentary and all these things. Um, I'm very bare in terms of, of what I own. I just own what I need. Um, I don't like to have more of it. I like to keep things very simple. <laughs> so yeah, those are the kind of shows that I, that I like to watch. Oh, here's, here's a, um, an unfortunate comment. Maybe your program can help. Jeannie says, my mom and I both have osteoporosis and osteopenia. Since going plant-based, both our repeat DEXA scans have continued to get worse. Okay. So a few things I would say, first of all, I would say book a call with our fit vegan goal setting coaches. We can have a deeper conversation with you because there's a ton of questions. We'd definitely love to ask you to get some more details, but one of them is they didn't necessarily mention that they were actively strength training or doing bone bearing activity. So that was one thing that I would just immediately look into, but definitely having a conversation, um, going on a website and book and call would be the best way because this, this requires a, a longer conversation. Um, uh, but again, just, for, just from the comment to provide value right away, if you're not strength training or doing bone bearing activities, I would start with doing something like that, right? Nutrition is great, but if you want to go to the next level, Having some physical fitness is is what will bring you there. As humans, we're meant to move, right? No. Well, I don't know. I mean, our ancestors always moved, but how? I mean, what did our ancestors do for upper body? Because they they weren't lifting weights back in the Stone Age. No, but if we go like really far back, they and they weren't vegans. So I'm just put this, but you know, they they were hunting. There were you know bows or throwing things or lifting heavy 
and dead animals or bring them back to the cage or cutting trees, climbing trees, right? They were physically fit. They were, they were walking a lot. They were moving a lot throughout the day, but let's be honest. Also us doing strength training is a new world solution to new world problem. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't have that issue back in the day. They weren't like, I need bigger biceps for this yeah. tribe to succeed. <laughs> They're like, we need to kill. So we, you know, we need to survive. And it wasn't like, I need a bigger chest or I need bigger arms. <laughs> That's my, or I need six pack abs. Yeah, they they did they they had it because they were starving because they weren't able to eat. So it was it was different different yeah. scenario. That's funny. I mean, because look at look at Fred Flintstone. He lived in the Stone Age. He was obese. Yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> all those all those brontosaurus burgers. Okay. Yeah. So Lori says, are you supposed to stretch before or after exercise? Great question. So you want to do something called dynamic stretching before workout. So a, a perfect example of dynamic stretching is like circular motions with your arms, right? Back and forth like this, kind of swinging your legs. So dynamic is there's movement to the stretch. Um, and then you want to do static stretching after your workout. So that's you going down and touching your toes while you're static, right? Holding your legs, you can stretch your quad, stretching your chest on the corner of a wall. So dynamic before and then static after. You want to hear something funny? I, I mean, not funny, but I thought, oh, he's coming on again. We're not going to have anything to talk about in that. Like we're already going over. There's so many questions. So. <laughs> hey, I, I'm, I'm free. I have no, nothing else booked after. So okay. how many of your questions you want? All right. Uh, we'll, we'll take a few more. So Ruthie says, how can we be sure if we are eating plant-based that we're getting all the essential amino acids, three of which presumably only found in animal protein? I don't know if that's actually true. I have read that quinoa, soy, and hemp do contain all the essential amino acids, but are those the only plant foods containing all of them? That's a great question. So no, those are not the only ones. Those are the most common ones known to contain all the essential amino acids. The big part about making sure you hit all the amino acids and, you know, we look at Simon Hill and all those big names in, in the, in the, in the vegan space, focusing on diversity, right? I'm interviewing uh, Dr. B in a few days. So same thing with them, right? Diversity, diversity, diversity. It's good for the gut, but it's also good to make sure that you have all the vitamins and nutrients that you need. So now I'm going to explain this process in a very like simplistic way, but in your body, you have a pool of amino acids. And so when you consume a food that doesn't contain all the essential amino acids that are in it in order for it to be absorbed, your body just goes into that pool, grab what it needs, and then you have a whole, a full source of protein and your body absorbs it. And so by focusing on diversity, you're constantly replenishing this pool that your body can dip into to make sure that what you're consuming, you get the complete amino acid profile. All right, very simplistic way of explaining it. So you don't need to worry about just eating sources of, of protein that are contain all the essential amino acids in one go. That's the equivalent of saying that you need to eat rice and beans at the same time, right? Like that was debunked a really long time ago. Yeah, Francis Moore LaPay actually, you know, debunked everything she said after that people got that in their heads that it was necessary to, to combine proteins. Yeah. So just, you know, focusing on diversity, making sure you're hitting your protein number for the day or that within that range and the rest focusing on diversity and you're going to be more than fine, right? In terms of amino acid, you don't need to be afraid. There's no need for you to worry. If you're worried about like deficiencies in certain vitamins and minerals, get blood work done, right? But you can't, like for amino acids, I just say focus on diversity. Great. So Latif asks, how do you feel about supplementation with vitamin D3 and K2? Uh, I think they're, they're a great supplement to have in your, in your arsenal, right? I know there's different school of thoughts. So some people will go more in the road of, you know, eat vegetables out of your garden that still has the dirt on it because it has some of those bacteria for the B12 and the chlorella will have certain, uh, source of absorbable B12 supplementation is the safest way. I think to this day to get it simply because a lot of our food is not produced the same way it was, you know, 60, 80 years ago. Right. So a D3, depending on where you live and K2 would be a great addition in, in supplements. Great. Thank you. I, did I see another question? Here we go. Um, what is what is the morning drink for Darius said? Did you mention a morning drink? Morning drink. Um well, I have, we have one for our members that we make our, we get our members to drink. It's a mixture of water, pink Himalayan salt and lemon, right? So it alkalizes your body in the morning. It hydrates it and provides it the electrolytes because you just spent like eight hours without drinking. And then you wake up and you pee. you're, you're removing those electrolytes from the body. So we have our members drink that in the morning and they do see like a, a surge in energy. Okay, great. Um, 
Lafzilla says, I was just told that I have a bit of osteoporosis on the crown of my pelvic bone. What exercise can I do to remedy this? I cycle 10 miles per day. Um, I would say including some bone bearing activity, like right? some squats, some deadlifts, some, some lunges, some walking lunges. Um, again, they don't have to be heavy weights, just a little bit more than your body weight. Right. So you can start to build that, that resistance and that pressure to strengthen the bone. And then again, making sure your nutrition is on top. All right. So if you're looking at strengthening the bone, it can't just be one or the other. It has to be both nutrition and bone bearing activity. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl said, I noticed olive oil and coconut butter in a few of your recipes from the download. Is there a specific reason or can I leave it out as I do not eat oil? Oh, absolutely. You definitely leave all of them out. Let me all them out. You can, what we tell our members to do is replace them with nuts and seeds in some of them. All right. Some of them have been creating by, by some of our teams, some have been created by me. So yeah, some do have oil, but we tell members that don't want oil. You absolutely do not need to use them. You can just put some, some walnuts or some pumpkin seeds or some hemp seeds on top of there. Okay. Thanks. Um, Pat says, I love weight training and been doing KB. Maybe that's kettlebells. I never wanted yeah. to be scrawny skinny as I age, but now I have a beautiful, I hope I pronounce this word, sinew. And um, when her dog was injured, I, she could lift her 60 pound dog into the car. I noticed that the older I get, the smaller my dogs keep getting because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're hard to lift. They're hard to lift. Well, gosh, yeah. I think that's all the questions. I'll keep it just a moment longer in case I miss any of the questions in the chat. If you watch on Facebook, it's preferable to watch on YouTube because the chat is there. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to be coming back the, the Sunday after Labor Day. Labor Day is Monday the 4th. You're, you're going to end the week and you're really going to be more, more interviewed by Robert Cheek, but then that's where we're going to have the big reveal of the wonderful gift that you're going to donate to. I guess it's, it'll be to a live viewer, but you'll figure out how we do that. Yeah, we'll work out all the details, but I'm very excited to be um, giving away the, the air fryer. Have one in my kitchen. It's a great tool. And I heard that uh, Breville was the one that was the most in demand. So we're going to get you guys that one. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Do you cook your own meals or do you have someone cook them for you? Um, at this time, I cook my own meals. Um, depending on how busy I get, sometimes I hire external help to help me, but the majority of the time I do make my own meals. Nice. I have an air fryer. It makes things so much easier. <laughs> you throw oh, everything I, in I there. love it. I love it. Can you do, oh, a, a Pat wanted to know if a person could do intermittent fasting while on your plan. Um, yes, you can. So the biggest thing is that if that fits your lifestyle, the best, a lot of people want to do intermittent fasting because they think it's a way to optimize fat loss. It is not right. It's great in terms of like, there's medical benefits, there's health benefits to it. But as long as you get all your calories in your energy in throughout the day, whether you do it in, you know, a six hour window or you eat it throughout the day, it won't make any difference. And so it just comes down to, again, personal preference and what suits your lifestyle best. So for Patrick, I'm not sure if intermittent fasting is what works best for his work and life schedule, or he's just doing it for, for fat loss. And so, yeah, we can definitely tweak the amount of meals. Again, it's tailored to you. Um, but definitely as long as you get all the food in, in the day, it'll be the best. And we don't want you to condense it in too, too little of meals because you have to eat a lot of food to be on the program, to lose the weight. So it's a lot of food to eat in a short period of time. If that's what you're trying to do. Yep. Uh, Lisa says, what is your take on salt? There is salt in your breakfast drink. Uh, yeah, so it's great. Pink Himalayan salt in terms of like getting your electrolytes after a night of sleep is it's good. You just want a little bit of it. There's like a quick, like a little bit in your water. You just got to think about it. You just went eight hours of sleep and then you went to the bathroom before you went to bed, before you woke up in bed, you're very depleted in electrolytes. And especially if you're a physically active person, you need those electrolytes in your body. I'm not saying to add salt everywhere, but it's a great way to kickstart the morning. And you do feel a better muscle contraction when you're doing your workout. Fantastic. Well, thanks. You are just a wealth of knowledge on this and it's very fun talking to you. Same here. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And we'll see you so whatever the Sunday is after September 4th. And so guys, bring your questions back or download his free guide or book a, an information or a discovery call if you'd like to try his program. And thank you so much for the work you do in dispelling all the myths about protein and vegan diets and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for the work that you do, right? Allowing me and other people to, to share their message and their story to impact the world in a greater way. It's very, it's very much appreciated. Yeah, that's kind of what I do. I like to be the, uh, the promoter of all things vegan. So thank you so much, Maxime. You're welcome.
All right. Take care, everyone. And thanks for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest is Marilee Jacobs. You may know her as the producer of a wonderful documentary called Eating You Alive. Well, she's at it again with a new documentary called Disease Reversal Hope, and we'll be talking